any second now. It's on. Oh, it's on? OK. It doesn't show for me. OK. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is another meeting of Park Office Hours. We have a code of conduct, a code of conduct that applies, and it is you can check the link. Uh, we have a document attached to the, this calendar event. That being said, the gist of it just try to be nice to each other. We have some agenda items today. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, and I guess the most important one is RTB has persistency right now. And good news is it's coming from community itself. So it's like makes it more valuable for us. Who wants to talk about that? I'm not the Arctic TV expert here, so. I mean, I wish um, the member of the community who contributed it was here to talk about it um, because that person definitely deserves to talk about it. But um, kind of the um, too long didn't read um, is that um, previously we were already uh, kind of accumulating parquet files in memory, right? Like that, that that was always kind of weird that we were writing parquet files into in memory buffers, right? A format that is meant to be written to disk. Um, and yeah, basically now uh, we already had this mechanism that we accumulate a certain amount of memory, right? And then we swapped it out. Um, and started a new chunk um, of data. And up, up until this change, um, that just meant that we threw away the thing that we uh, rotated out um, and just started new. And that's still what, what we've released most recently in Parco. But with these changes, we're now kind of, once we rotate, we write all of the data into a single contiguous Parquet file and then upload that to one of the object storage providers that we support. So because we use kind of the abstraction that the Thanos project originally um, created, we basically support all of the ones that Thanos supports. So um, probably going to be a non-exhaustive list, but like Google Cloud Storage, um, Azure Blob Storage, um, S3, obviously, anything compatible with S3. Um, there are a bunch of other object storage providers out there that are supported. Um, I don't know all of them, but um, and if people really want to, you know, avoid all of the object storage stuff, um, one of the providers is also a local file system provider. So if people want to, you can just run it um, with with local disk. That said, this is definitely extremely experimental, right? Like <laughs> we like. Basically, it compiles, and we've seen it write files to disk, um, and we we've seen it read so, uh, that data back. But that's basically the um, the extent of where we are today. Like, there none of this is optimized. There's no like page cache. Basically, we just read the file whenever we do a, a request, and basically we rely on like file system cache doing any caching at all. Um, so. Definitely don't take this as all, like all persistence, persistency problems in uh, uh, Arctic DB or in Parker have been solved, but this was a really, really, really important step. So yeah, happy to go into any details if people have any questions about the implementation. Any questions? OK, maybe you can give uh, it a try and let us know if you've seen anything wrong with that so that we can just like iron out the last wrinkles. Yeah, actually, so we don't even have the support for it in in Parka yet. So that's something that um, I've been meaning to add so that we have like an experimental flag or something in Parka that you can like pass and it'll say like experimental persist Arctic DB or something like that, right? Like something uh, that is very obviously um, indicating that you're you're about to use something highly experimental. Um, but 
then we can all start to try it out and, and continue to improve it. That would be an awesome community contribution. <laughs> yeah, if anybody wants to give it a shot, like the the flag and everything is already it already exists in Arctic DB, right? So it's basically, you know, quote unquote, it's just piping it through from the Parka flags to um, to the Arctic DB instantiation. Definitely would be super cool if someone wants to give it a try. Cool. I think Albert, mm, you yeah. unmute yourself. We can't hear you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No problem. We'll we'll continue while Albert uh, fixes his mic, and then we'll get back to this point. Cool. Uh, we have then two other small agenda items. One is an update. We just like discovered a bug in the latest release of Park Agent. That's why we patched it. And there's a new version uh, 0 0.8.1, uh, which is fixes that bug. And you, you can now, like it was about symbolization and to, to symbolize the stack traces, we actually use other binaries. We just kind of funnel them out to uh, EU stripped or object copy, maybe you already know uh, about them. We just like use those binaries to extract the debug information from the running processes and then we upload them for symbolization in the backend. And that uh, connection, we while we were working on uh, statically linking the binary itself, the park agent itself, we removed uh, some certain dependencies which were actually used by those binaries as well. Uh, so it's fixed. Uh, right now, the patch release is working. And we are also working a way to actually totally avoid uh, having those external binaries. Hopefully, in the next release, uh, it will be more stable. And we won't have any external dependencies. Just it will be park agent static link binary so that you can run it everywhere. And what else? Yes. And the, on the other news, uh, we actually uh, migrated uh, to Rust uh, for writing our eBPF programs, uh, which is kind of cool because we will be able to write tests. And uh, thanks to Rust compiler, we will be able to just like catch the problems earlier than actually the load stage. Uh, right now, the EBPF verifier actually gives you certain guarantees, but it only happens in the runtime when you actually load the program into kernel, and sometimes uh, bugs kind of can slip under our radar. So to, to, to prevent that, we are migrating our pipeline completely to Rust. And as I told you, like better compiler to catch the errors earlier, plus uh, we are depending on uh, another a library called Aya, which is uh, written Rust. And thanks uh, to Aya community, they also write a BPF linker, which actually enables all of all those things. And thanks to that project, we will have unit test support soon. So it would be nice to actually have tests for the eBPF programs. And we also gave a talk on that uh, with a member of the community, uh, of Aya, Dave. Uh, so we, how we uh, we went through the story of how we came together and actually make this happen. So you can check the recording out. There were some issues with the uh, media setup, but like at least we have some part, portion of recording. So I hope it can give you the idea. I guess this is what I have as news in the agenda. If you have any other item that you want to discuss, like agenda is always open. You can add your add the things, or the board is just open if you want to just like talk about anything, or if you have any questions, just go for it. Maybe a quick introduction round um, for the people who are new, um, so we can learn what they are. Uh, you, like for what they are using Parka and where they are interested in in Parka and profiling in general, that would be super interesting. 
So I'm Matthias Leuwe, I'm a software engineer at Polar Signals and yeah, work on all of this. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Great idea. Let me go next. Uh, I'm Kemal. I'm also working on the uh, Parker project. Profiles. I think we lost him. Yeah, I think we lost him. Okay. <laughs> Anyone want to go next? I, I can go next. Uh, hey, I'm Frederick. Um, I, I founded Polar Signals and yeah, also work on Parka and um, Parka agent and everything in, in this world. <laughs> um, hey everyone, I'm Yomi. Uh, I also work on Polar Signals and I work on the front end for um, the Parka project. I can go. Uh, I'm Michal. I work on RabbitMQ. Um, we are looking at Parka. We cannot really say that we are using it as such. Uh, we have one environment where, where it's running and we are just you know, trying to understand how it will help us. Um, in the last few months, we did quite a lot of work in terms of adopting Perf for just you know profiling of, of RabbitMQ, you might have seen the last uh, blog post about using Perf and the previous one, which is basically with the results uh, that uh, well, improvements we've made to RabbitMQ in 3.10 that uh, to, to a large extent were, you know, thanks to Perf and what it allowed us to see. So next step is continuous profiling, of course. Very cool. We're we're definitely super interested in hearing all of your experience, um, and also, I, I, I'm I'm curious um, how how useful for you um, is it to see you know everything up that happens in the Erlang VM, in addition to everything that um, you know, let's call it e user or application code, right? Um, like some sometimes I wonder because. We write Go, right? So we don't see much of the runtime. Um, but I'm curious sometimes with languages that have um, like virtual machines like Erlang or in Java, is it could it be useful to have kind of a view also where you're completely hiding the um, the virtual machine aspects, or is it interesting to see those? So there are definitely things that are very interesting. Um, ultimately, you know, at some point we call to Erlang for some basic operations. So, um, you know, we we probably need to improve our code, not Erlang VM's code, although that happens every now and then. Uh, but uh, we want to see it. However, I'm not sure if there's actually any search right now in the UI. I uh, didn't jump out, jump out at me, and that's definitely something that when I compared what what, what I saw with a, a GoLang app um, or even this example that I shared today, you know, there's there's basically one module, one function, so that was easy. But I also ran RabbitMQ with some workload, and the number of functions, stacks, um, automatic processes, Erlang processes that map to uh, operating system threads is uh, is much higher so to be honest right now the um the graph is not very useful until at least the initial click like when i select the part where actually you know the rabbit part is running uh, then i can actually you know recognize okay i can see this this part that handles like persistence and this part that handles connections and you know, i start to see the things that i know but the initial view is like, you know, 60%, I don't even recognize what that, what that is. Um, that's uh, perhaps made even worse because for whatever reason, we still have quite a lot of unresolved symbols there that I, that I, I just don't know what they are right now. So I'm not even sure what to install to, to fix that. The Erlang symbol seems to be resolved just fine. So in terms of like, you know, Parka support for Erlang, I think it's it's there. I'm just surprised what else is running there that, that is not resolved correctly. 
I, I'm curious, does it say um, the name of the like object that um, that the stack comes from that that wasn't um, symbolized? Um, no, I just see as X symbol. Mm -hmm. Some of these, I believe, these are parts of Rabbit that I'm not very familiar with, but I believe there are some parts where, for example, to monitor the disk space, because we have a feature where, you know, if we're running out of disk because it's a you know, persistent system, we don't want to end up with like partial write or stuff like that. So we monitor the disk space and we will just block the publishers when we are getting close to, uh, to the disk usage. And um, for that, we actually call out to some, like we basically perform an XX to some operating system level tool. So these kind of tools, I would imagine, maybe they don't have debug symbols, but there's just too many of these to, to explain that with just this one thing. Um, I don't know, I basically just started looking into that today. So hopefully I will, I will find it, but if you know any tricks, the only one I know right now is the find debug symbols package in Ubuntu, which helps, uh, but uh, well, for now it did not solve all my problems. So we do, if the if the debug symbols are available on Ubuntu, we should be able to discover them server side um, because we um, we have uh, we we have support for something called uh, debug info D, and um, I, I, maybe you're familiar with this, but um, from I know it exists. I've never used it, and uh, you might have seen in the in the log file. I shared. I, I, I focused on the on the stack trace, the exception, the, the, the panic that I got. Uh, but if you have a look at that file, you will see a lot of warnings about the, the debugging for D not working. Um, I, you know, given just my lack of experience, I'm not sure how normal that is. You know, should that just work? If I see any messages about that, does it mean it's my environment or is that just not necessarily working yet? I don't know. So I, I would expect at the very least that um, that we know the mapping name, right? Um, if, if, if there's no mapping name, chances are so either something went wrong when we were um, walking the stack. And this can happen if uh, like frame pointers are skipped um, at compile time. And unfortunately, like a lot of like C++ programs, or sometimes even in the C world, people do this, um, where essentially we can just walk the stack. We need to actually use like unwind tables to to do the lookups to do the jumps, and we don't actually have support for that yet. So that's one thing that could happen. And then the other thing is, um, and we don't haven't really figured out why this happens. And this can happen in Perf as well. Um, is that we walk the stack stack too far um, into an address that actually makes no sense. Um, and at that point, we're just like, okay, the next thing that we then find is is kind of a, 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 an address that doesn't make sense, and then we just stop. But it's possible that we've, you know, walked at least one uh, address that uh, potentially was garbage. Um, we haven't really figured out why we even do that one step. Um, but there are a couple of theories why this could could be the case. Uh, and, and like I said, actually the the exact same thing happened in perf. Um, so it could be actually something in the kernel that we're not one hundred percent sure of. So yeah, th there are a couple of things why there could be completely unresolved things that also have no mapping associated with it. Ideally, if there's a mapping, then we should be able to discover the debug infos from debug info D if they are available on the distros. So yeah. and to check whether there is a mapping, that's uh, I would see that in the Parker UI or just LDD or something. Yeah, you you sh you you would see that kind of um, if you if you hover over the slice, it would say mapping something um, and then the address. Um, also, as a as a prefix, we also put uh, the name of the mapping if we can discover those. That's right. I, I think that only happens if there's more than one mapping, though. If there's only a single mapping, I think we skip it in the prefix, but I'm not 100% sure. Maybe Yomi okay. knows. I, I don't know for sure. 
Uh, I'm happy to continue the discussion, but I'm actually not everyone even introduced themselves. I'm not sure if I'm the only yeah. external person. Let, 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 let's continue and then we can continue the discussion unless there are other questions. <laughs> I'll go next then. I, I am Varun. I'm from Acunox. I work on a project called Cubano, which is also based in the eBPF ecosystem. I joined because I I was the talk of the of Kemal here about eBPF safety and was interested in like how you all are dealing with Rust and how's the experience been. So I joined. That's why I joined. It was nice to know that, uh, like, about how you are planning to add unit tests and stuff, and how it has helped you reduce the compile time bugs. And I'm considering writing some Rush code now as well. I've been writing EBPF in C till now, and yes, it has been a frustrating experience of it. So I'll, let's see how it goes. That's all from. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll go next. I think my microphone's finally fixed. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, get some thumbs up. Thanks, guys. Uh, so my name is Albert Lockett. I work um, at a company called Sonray Security um, in a performance engineering role. Um, we're currently in the process of um, trying to adopt Parka in our um, development environment. Um, it's been a it's been an ongoing process. It's kind of been competing with some other priorities, but it's it's a work in progress here. Um, and I also uh, sometimes fix some small bugs in Arctic DB uh, in my spare time. Um, and that's it for me. I guess I'm left. Uh, hi, I'm Ujwal. I work at Last Nine, and uh, I've been contributing to part of our documentation and some code issues for a couple of weeks now. And yeah, that's it. Awesome, I guess that's everybody. Yeah, nice. That that was really interesting and like the answers being super diverse. So I'm I'm glad we went through all of this. Uh, I'm kind of a quick question for you, Albert. Uh, is there anything other than time that that is holding you back in terms of deployment? Like, can we generate yeah. better manifests or? No, it's uh, it's totally just uh, cycles on my side. The uh... You know, some some good feedback for you guys is I uh, followed the steps from the Arctic or the Parker website, the old website to install, and it just it worked first try, totally good. So uh, that was pretty cool, actually. But <laughs> anyway, next uh, next step for us is uh, um, trying to get um, uh, working with our Java. We have a lot of Java um, in our in our architecture, and so I'm aware that we can use Perf Map Agent for that, and we just. Uh, um, just a matter of uh, finding the cycles on my side to give it a shot. Awesome. Side note, that's also absolutely something we want to improve, right? We don't want you to have to install the PerfMap agent. I, I don't know for sure. I think Kimai knows better, but I think we might have started looking into this. Not yet, but next week. So okay. it's really on top of our list. So. We are about to start that. Just <laughs> hang in there. <laughs> about the other discussion, we are also working on enabling the advanced stack like, unwinding. So we may also can help with that as well. Like those two features we really want to tackle as uh, quickly as possible. Uh, there are some challenges, but Let's see, uh, finding the debug information and uh, like uh, stack unwinding, these are like super challenging because people really want to get rid of or like get those facilities so that they can squeeze the last bit of uh, performance from their binaries, which is kind of sucks because then you can't enable any profilers or debuggers to actually make the make your programs faster. So yeah. I'm actually uh, so something that just popped into my head. Is it possible for um, 
I, I, I guess I don't see why it wouldn't be, but um, I'm just curious if there's something preventing something from being a position independent executable and skip and require um, stack unwinding. I guess I guess be, be, I guess I can maybe answer my own question, but you correct me if I'm wrong. I, I would think it's probably possible because the only thing that second mining means that is that we're not populating certain registers um, when executing, right? And so I guess there's nothing preventing your position as independent executable from skipping it, right? No, no. Like when you have the position independent code, you can you actually have relative addresses. So that like any address that you have, you can actually translate those. So like there, there is no need to actually do that. I guess people just want to reuse that extra registers and that's why they want to get rid of the stack pointers. But yeah, yeah I don't know how, like there is no scientific study on that, how much actually they uh, improve the performance. I would love if we could write a blog post like that and make it scientific just to show people that <laughs> like having being able to debug your infrastructure is better than like squeezing out 0.01% in performance or whatever it is, right? Exactly. I, we can actually do that, right? We can uh, I'm sure we will have some customers or like users that can provide that use case for us, right? Like using Parka and optimizing something and all of a sudden you get, get like 30% uh, reduction on your CP usage versus by just like removing the stack pointer, you got like, what, like a top 3% or something. This is just like kind of a gut feeling that I have, but we should definitely can measure this and scientifically uh, create some benchmarks. Yeah. The, the reason why I bring it up is because I, I, I was trying to think of um, Michal. Is, is that how, how I pronounce how, how to pronounce your name? Michal. Michal. Um, uh, like basically, I was trying to figure out: is there a way why maybe like the Erlang VM itself couldn't be um, that the stack couldn't be walked? And I, I guess that could be the case, right? Like if there there are no frame pointers in the Erlang VM binary itself. This, this could happen. Ultimately, you know, Erlang VM is written in C and could just, you know, not have the symbols. But I'm pretty sure that uh, I do see the symbols from the, you know, the binary of the Erlang VM itself, and the symbols I would expect from within Erlang. So it's either some additional external tools that we call, or I'm not sure what exactly. Right. If I if I zoom in on the part that I recognize, what I would normally capture with perf is pretty much there. Right. Like with perf, we always capture a specific process, so it's slightly easier. Uh, but basically, you know, if I focus on, on on this part, I see roughly what I would expect from perf. And yet, there is like I don't know, another half that I just completely I have no idea what that, what that is. Most likely. I, I, I don't see how we could be running so much stuff outside of the Erlang VM. So it seems like it's something in, uh, incorrectly resolved. And because of these incorrectly resolved symbols, it's just not merged with the other stack traces. And that's why how why I see so many of them, right? Um, but uh, yeah, at this point, I have no, no idea really what, what that is and why would some work and some not. Yeah, yeah this is actually really accurate because what happens right now for the stack unwinding we ask things from kernel right and if kernel fails to unwind the stack and just sends us some gibberish like out of uh, range addresses so that what, what happens in there okay we know this address but we cannot map this anywhere so it's just some stack trace full of like uh, hexadecimal codes that we don't know anything about right so what i would suggest as like frederick said Make sure that the Erlang VM itself, all the like the dynamically linked binaries of the runtime has some debug information or at least the frame pointers enabled. Uh, certain runtimes are, they are being really good citizens and they just like put the frame pointers and debug information in there, like Node.js, even with their production environment. But I'm not sure if it's the case with the Beam, but 
I'm sure there are like some packages that you can actually install with the debug information. Let's make sure that that all the, those things in there, then we can check out what yeah. we are missing. So I already installed the debug symbol packages from Ubuntu that I have on my Linux box where I use perf, right? And there, when I capture the specific process, I think there's just one small part of the graph that is still not resolved for some reason. I'm not sure what that is, but but it's it's very small, so I don't care that much. But in this case, it's like, you know, you can see on the graph, well, maybe not very well because there's just so much stuff in there, but uh, Basically, the thing in the middle, which starts with ERTS beam ASM, that's basically the application that I want to focus on, right? If I click there, all the symbols are resolved, and that's where I see Rabbit functions, modules, and so on. And what this other stuff is, I'm not sure. So, so the ones um that don't have any mapping in front of them that that means that we that we probably failed to walk the stack um I, i'm pretty sure especially the ones where immediately under it there is a kernel stack because clearly we were able to walk the kernel stack just fine um because we walked the kernel stack and the user space stack separately um and so that, that is extremely likely then that literally the first address was immediately just trash. Um, so that I would hope gets probably better with uh, stack unwinding. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually pretty excited how well it does work. <laughs> um, g given that we thought that we had absolutely zero Erlang support. Um, so that's pretty cool. But yeah, th think, like whenever you see um, anything like this, please feel free to like uh, drop drop in drop a screenshot on Discord so that we can kind of have a look and figure out whether this is something you know sure. that could. I can also give you a very short manifest that deploys Rabbit, which should work. So if you want to just have it in your environment, that should be easy. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, we have the demo instance where we already have a few things. If it's not too memory or CPU intensive, then then that's definitely something where we can put that on uh, on that instance as well. Sorry, Yomi, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to say that, Michael, I think you mentioned that um, you were not able to search for spans or nodes. I just wanted to say that we actually have um, a PR in progress that would allow you to be able to do that soon. So yeah, once that's in there, you should be able to like search for those little spans that you can't that you can't see in the graph so that should be awesome. awesome at least. Yeah. Uh, there are some you know probably Erlang specific caveats that may be applicable to some other languages as well. I'm not sure at this point, but uh, you know with the with the process model in Erlang where basically you have these you know lightweight processes and they map to actual threads. So a thread that the operating system can see will like internally run Processes kind of like go routines, um, but uh, I believe the default is I, I don't remember right now. But you know, within a second, the same thread we run multiple different Erlang processes, and I wonder how that affects. Um, you know, um, does the frequency of sampling affect that because we swap between different processes very often, right? Like, is there is it different or is it not really that different? For me, it, I feel like it would be useful to be able to see which process, Erlang process, actually called something, but I don't think that's something you can do. Um, that's just like invisible to the operating system level tools that would need to be, I don't know, maybe some BPF support in Beam or something like that, I'm not sure. Uh, where you will have just additional metadata that this function was called from this process. Um, in many cases, we can just guess, right? Like if we know, if we see some connection related function in the stack, we know it was a connection process. There was no other <laughs> processes called this, right? Uh, so it's not terrible. It's not like I have no idea where that came from, but also given how, how often you use like list functions and mapping functions and uh, you know, some very basic concepts 
where you know they can come from anywhere. And sometimes even with perf, I'm not sure exactly why, but sometimes you would see you know the beam, a rabbit function, and then let's say uh, a very tall stack trace of like recursive lists functions or something like that. But every now and then there will be beam, the list function, the stack of list functions, and then a, a function that I actually recognize from rabbit, which I would expect to be below that, right? Looking at the flame graph, not icicle graph in this case. But uh, I don't know why the why the order would be different. But as I said, that's that's about perfs right now, which I just have more experience with. I guess these are super specific to beam runtime. Uh, that's why, like, I don't think we can actually, if they are just function calls at the end, may, maybe we can trace them back and have a stack trace. Even with the, the frequent context switching, it shouldn't be a problem, but I don't think they are, like, kind of connected when it, like, a uh, scheduler decides to put something on a thread and it starts calling something else. So we probably we can't make those connections. But what we can do in the long run, Beam has excellent facilities about monitoring, right? Like the, uh, the virtual machine itself, it has everything in there. What we can maybe consider converting them to the PPRO format in the long run, and then we can push them to the parka and maybe correlate with the kernel stack as well. Uh, by that, we can have more visibility. But other than that, I don't think we can do anything in the Linux kernel level, with, even with the eBPF and everything that have all yeah. that detailed context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Beam, Beam supports uh, D-Trace and system tap and some other stuff, but has no explicit eBPF support at this point. Maybe once it does, it will be helpful. Um, I'm not sure in terms like right now, I, I only see Parka in the context of CPU something, but I, I believe I've seen you know, some mentions that there will be others. Can you say anything about that? Like if, if, if a piece of software, you know, exposes some, so for example, with, with uh, D-Trace right now with Beam, I can request information about uh, um, garbage collection, for example, right? Like it has, hooks to tell me that it started garbage collection on this process, that it completed this garbage collection, that this amount of memory was freed up. Um, if I had that in the BBF format, could Parker capture that? So just, just to be clear about like um, eBPF, right? Like we, we hook into the perf subsystem. So we literally do the same thing as perf. Um, and it, that works on an overflow basis. So every, let's say, 100 CPU cycles, the BPF program gets run. And all we're presented with is um, this is the like stack that the operating system has built. Um, and that's it, right? Like, uh, and it's just a bunch of memory addresses. So everything that, we, that you see in the UI is essentially from that point, kind of walking backwards and making sense of it. So uh, I, I think it's not actually that like D-Trace support needs to end up in eBPF. I, I think we could potentially one day see Parka agent supporting D-Trace um, so that you could have, I don't know, some sort of configuration that would um, be able to capture that kind of information at the agent level, then build a PPROF profile from it and also send it um, off to Parka. At least that's how I, I think I would see it. There are a couple of things that do work generically in the same way as CPU profiling, right? Like one that keeps coming up is allocation profiling. Um, we can do the same thing, right? Like except for hooking into the perf subsystem, we attach our eBPF program to some function that can, can be called in the kernel that allocates memory, right? Um, so yeah. That, that's hopefully that gives a, a bit of an overview of um, how, at least how I think about potential additions. I think one thing we can also do directly support like Erlang has FProf and EProf, those type of profilers we can 
have a program to expose maybe p prof endpoints by just like converting them something like that would be also something we can consider and it would be easier i just quickly checked apparently no one actually bothered to implement p prof for erlang yet so maybe we can do that with c prof f prof i'm not sure how useful that would be like since we Basically, we could only use Perf with Erlang since uh, Erlang 24, which was released a year ago, uh, because it's only now that it has the just-in-time compiler, so we actually see you know real code on the Perf level, uh, and we you know within a few months we started experimenting with that and then started using this. Um, since then, I basically I'm not sure even if I used once like fprof, cprof. Like now that we have that, that's basically what we want. Um, so for this one, I, I'm not sure if that would be useful. Um, one thing that I don't know if it's possible is uh, to change the frequency of something, given that, you know, for me personally, that's maybe not the exact use case for Parka, but it's not about continuous profiling of a production environment. It's about continuous profiling of our, you know, performance tests and other test environments. And for this, especially given the nature of, of RabbitMQ messaging and, and other things, you know, every now and then we'll have like a latency spike and we would like to be able to drill down and see, you know, what might have happened there. Um, with relatively uh, low frequency, which totally makes sense for monitoring production systems and like, you know, aggregate view of what consumes your resources. Uh, that's, that makes total sense, but for our use case where we want to you know, run a specific workload and when we see that the, you know, the, the, the latency of sending messages uh, was higher for, you know, it can be for a second, right? And, and if we just don't have enough samples from that second, we may completely remain blind basically what happened there. I'm, I'm just with you, I'm speculating. As I said, like, you know, we are just starting experimenting with Parka, so maybe it won't be the problem. Uh, but uh, I, I have a suspicion at this point. I made some, you know, try to compare some different moments uh, captured with Parka today, and uh, I didn't really see that. You know, I could see a spike in latency. I could not explain that with what I saw in Parka at this point. So one one configuration uh, that you could already try is we make the profile duration configurable. So you could make the duration not 10 seconds, which is the default, but let's say one second. Um, and then obviously Parker agent will be sending more and smaller profiles, but you can narrow it down to a smaller window. Cool, I'll try that. The, the, uh, I, I'd be curious definitely to hear whether that uh, already solves it or if we also need to make the frequency config configurable. So definitely would love to um, hear your feedback on that. Yeah, I will let you know. Awesome. I think we forgot to ask um, Albert. Did you want to want to say something earlier when we finished the Arctic DB point? Oh, sorry, guys. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was just going to ask you about the Arctic DB um, kind of roadmap generally. Uh, we mentioned some of the stuff that we're going to do from related to persistence, but I was wondering if there's any other um, kind of features that that we're hoping to add or, or work on here in the maybe the the near to near future. So I think in the closest future, um, at least in, in the like realm of the Parka project, I think it's improving and like continue to create more optimizers for the query planner. Like there's so much potential and we're still iterating over so much data that is completely useless for, for a query. Um, yeah. That, yeah, I, I think there are just tons and tons of um, possibilities. And then, um, of course, also the ability to parallelize uh, the execution. Right now, everything is kind of single core, right? Um, where there's a single thing that waits for the next iteration and processes basically the entire loop 
um, and it would be really cool if we could um, split up and kind of build a tree of execution as opposed to something that's linear in execution. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, that was uh, um, kind of what I was looking for, just the general direction. So yeah, that answers that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, no problem. If there's anything in particular that you're interested in working on, we can definitely talk more on Discord about that as well. Yeah, sure thing. Sounds good. Um, right, like lately, I've just been going through the code base and, um, you know, trying to get familiar with it. And so, but yeah, for sure. Awesome. Can need all the, uh, we, we could use all the help we can get. There's uh, at, like query optimizers and optimizing queries is just, it's a, it's a never ending task. Like there's always more performance that you can squeeze out of uh, something. So yeah, definitely would appreciate help. Right. Any other questions or comments? I have a GitHub issue I can discuss if no one has anything else. Like I can do it other places as well. But if anyone wants to go ahead, then they can. No, please go ahead. We have time. Okay. okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Yeah, of course. So this is regarding the paper of uh, prefixes. Uh, am I sharing my screen? Um, it's, sh yeah, now. No, no, yeah, no you are, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is regarding the enable prefix for pprof. So basically one part of this I have implemented already where you don't have to specify these uh, repeated paths. You can just specify a path prefix and that is, uh, added to the path that you add. Uh, the part that I didn't understand was delabeling. So uh, Frederick had commented on this, that static configs were, uh, we can probably use the Prometheus one now for static configs. So I checked the Prometheus code and the static configs uh, are defined in exactly the same way in Parka as in Prometheus. So can we just use the Prometheus Parka ones because they're basically the same. Yeah, I, I, I think we can probably just use the Prometheus ones. I think the reason why we kind of have them duplicate in Parka is because in the very beginning, we didn't have any service discovery. And we were like, we're not going to take on the Prometheus um, dependency, which is ginormous, right, um, of the, the service discoveries. Because basically what we end up doing is we import all of Kubernetes, all of Azure, all of AWS, and all of these like really uh, giant dependencies. But ultimately, people wanted those service discoveries. So we ended up importing all of it. But I think we just never deleted the thing that we ended up copying. Uh, so the other part was I didn't understand what exactly I would um, modify while relabeling. So this is an example that uh, Julian provided. So uh, these targets would, uh, so let's take Prometheus PR. Would this be something like uh, this label is uh, modified to have some other path? So <laughs> Julian is doing something very um, advanced and also sort of hacky. Um, so if you go down to uh, where the targets are defined. Yes. Technically, um, a target is supposed to be a full address. So HTTP um, and then an IP slash metrics or something like that, right? OK. Um, or actually not, not without the slash metrics. But that's what it's technically supposed to be. And that's what um, whatever is the target, um, if you scroll down again to where the target definition is, whatever is the yes. target, in this case, Prometheus PR and Prometheus release, right? What he's yes. doing is um, that is now what is in the underscore, underscore, address, underscore, underscore um, label. And what he's doing is he's relabeling what is that into this path, right? And he's 
um, changing the pprof prefix config, basically. Mm -hmm. um, using so what is this. inside this? What is inside that? It's putting he's putting it into that replacement string, ultimately ending up in that target label. Uh, so I get the source. Uh, it's using the source label to put it in the target label using this replacement, but I didn't get what uh, this target uh, refers to. Uh, so the address is, of this. That, that's right. So that, that, that's the, that, the that's why the other rules are important. What he then does is um, he also relabels the address into the instance label so that he can uh, differentiate them afterwards. And then mm -hmm. the next thing is that he actually makes the um, actual address that is going to be uh, scraped, he puts something new into the address label, which is now prombench.prometheus.io. Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, so uh, these targets uh, are, so I get what what's being trying to done here. Uh, so these targets in pprof config, what exactly would they be if they are something? It would result in this and another target that requests the same host, but with a different path. No, so Prometheus PR would be something like memory total, or was it would it be something else? Um, yes, it, it would it, it it would essentially change the um, just the prefix, and then it would still um, add all of the paths that are um, defined in each of these. Hmm. Okay, so I'll try to write. Uh, a bit about this so that I can show it to you before uh, moving forward with the code. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay, thanks. Also, <laughs> the, like, to be fair, this is a very, very, very advanced relabeling config, and I had to stare at it for, for a good 10 minutes to understand what Julian was doing there. So, like, <laughs> um, Okay. Supporting this and understanding this is is tough. So uh, just to clarify, this is independent of Prometheus uh, configs, right? This is just related to Parka. This is just related to Parka. It just happens that we, you know, adopted a lot of the philosophy that Prometheus yeah. created. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Awesome. Any other topics? Anyone else to speak up? All right, nice. Thanks everyone for attending. This was amazing. I guess this was the longest office hours that we have. A lot of contributions from the community. So it's like super exciting to see this. Uh, thanks again for attending. Uh, we have a, dis a Discord channel if you want to continue the discussion or if you want to ask any questions in between the office hours, feel free to ask questions in those channels. Uh, we are always responsive to the questions coming from the community. Then being sent, uh, I guess see you in two weeks in the next iteration of office hours. See you in two Bye, weeks. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.